Good morning, everyone. Is there any smile in anybody's face underneath those masks? Uh, you can see I'm smiling. It really is a joy and a delight to be able to see half of your faces at least for this first Sunday in nearly five and a half months. Can I welcome the members of the session, the committee and their families to Glenmurray Presbyterian Church and truly is a delight to be able to worship together corporately as the Lord's word instructs us so to do. I want to begin by thanking a few people. I'm not going to mention names for fear of omitting someone, but a number of people have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to prepare our church building for today. A special word of thanks must go to this subcommittee which was formed to plan and prepare the back to church and for the way they've managed to do that. Also to a couple of ladies who were co-opted onto that committee who have cleaned, helped in the cleaning of our building here uh, this past week. Also want to thank the members of the audio and the visual team. There has been new visual cameras put in place. We can now stream across to the hall and we will begin to do that next week. And we know there's a lot of effort has gone on into that. So thank you to everyone. Uh, You know what you have done. Can I also welcome all who will listen to this service later on, on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel or on the DVD or CDs. I trust you all will be blessed as we join together to worship the one true living God. I am really looking forward to seeing some more faces, or at least half of their faces, next week, as we welcome the whole of our congregation back to worship with us here in the church. Just a few announcements with regards to next Sunday. Please note next Sunday the service reverts to 12 noon, and to facilitate the stewards to ensure everyone is uh, seated safely and in in line with the COVID-19 regulations, I would encourage you all to begin to arrive as punctually as possible Half past 11 would be a good idea to make a 12 noon prompt start. I also want to encourage everyone here today and those listening at home uh, to look at our Facebook page throughout the week. There will be a back to church guidance video uh, uploaded perhaps sometime on Tuesday afternoon. So from then onwards, if you could have a look at that, it'll help you to see what you need to prepare for. Back to church will be different than it has been beforehand. Also, for anyone watching this service on the DVD, please, as soon as the service is concluded and I pronounce the benediction, can I encourage you to watch on because that Back to Church guidance video has also been included in your DVD for this week. I also have been asked to announce that if anyone does display symptoms of COVID-19, could you please just remain at home for the time being in the interest of your own safety and the safety of others. But can I assure that if there are anyone who can't come to church for shielding reasons or for any other purpose at this time, that all of our services in the future will be uploaded to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel early each Sunday afternoon. We also continue to plan to provide the DVDs and the CDs in the way ahead. No formal offering will be received during the service. Instead of that, plates are provided. You may have seen them on the way in. On the way out, if you have got envelopes and you would like to distribute them in the vestibule area of the church, there are two plates there and there also will be a plate next week across the way in the church hall. A photograph, it'll look well, is going to be taken every Sunday at each service for track and trace purposes. Matthew or is going to organize that. Those are all our announcements. During lockdown, we've been doing a theme, we've been looking at the book of Ecclesiastes, and in the providence of God this morning, we come to the end of that series. It's that series entitled Chasing After the Wind. The theme of this morning's text is a great, well-known motive in in, in effect for Presbyterians. It's man's chief end. Man's chief end. Now, I'm not going to ask you what it is to quote the shorter catechism, but our theme today is man's chief end. What is man's chief end? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Solomon the preacher says in the same words almost, it's to fear God and to keep His commandments. So, we're going to be looking at the prologue of this Old Testament book. Let's first of all just focus our minds as we read from God's Word in Deuteronomy chapter 12. These are the words that God gave to Moses to his people. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, 
to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And verse 13 goes on and says, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. We're called to fear the Lord and to keep his commandments. And as followers of Jesus Christ, this instruction, yes, was given to Old Testament Israel. We now are the New Testament Israel, and this is our commandment. This is what the Lord wants us to do with our lives. With that in mind, just let's come to the Lord now as we seek his face in prayer. Let's pray together. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Father God, we bow in your presence today and we can all assert that we truly are glad we will come into your house at a time such as this. We thank it in your sovereign plan. You have made it possible for us to come and to worship you as a, as a body of believers here in Glenwarry in this building once again. And Father, many of us, in fact, all of us have missed that experience of corporate worship. To worship online, we thank you for that. But Lord, it just isn't the same as meeting together with brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you indeed that one of the reasons why you have called us into relationship with yourself is so that we would have relationship with one another. And Lord, we could encourage one another each Sunday as we meet together to bless you. And so we bless you, Lord, that we're able to do that once again in Glenwary Church. And we also bless you for the many people who have worked tirelessly within the body of Christ here over this past few weeks to prepare for a day such as this. And Father, as we come to worship you, we acknowledge you that you are the, the almighty God. You are the eternal God. You are the holy, the sovereign God, the one who is, is full of love and mercy, but also God of justice and wrath. A God who is to be feared. Proverbs reminds us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. Father, we pray today that you would grant us a holy fear of you. Help us to be given a fresh vision of who you are. Such an awesome, transcendent God who entered into this seam of time in a personal way. Over 2,000 years ago in the, in the form of your Son, our Saviour. We thank you that Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary for sinners such as us. We thank you, Lord, that he shed his precious blood that we might be forgiven, that we might become sons and daughters of the one true living God. And Father, we thank you that we come here this morning as an expression of our love for you, as an expression of our thanksgiving for who you are and what you have called us to be in Christ. But Lord, at the beginning of our service, we confess that we are mindful of the fact that, that there have been times in our lives whenever we have not loved you, we have not served you, we have not obeyed you as you would deserve and desire. And so we ask that you would forgive us for all of our sins of that nature today. In fact, we ask that you would cleanse us of all of our sins of thought and word and deed through the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And Father, we thank you indeed that you're a faithful God. Your word reminds us that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just, and you will forgive us our sins, and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we ask you to do that now at the outset of this service, and a sense at the beginning of a new year, a new start here in our church. And we pray indeed you would meet with us in a very special way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to open our service today with a piece of reflective praise. We haven't done that before. That means we're going to listen to the, uh, listen to the, to the music of How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place. Uh, we're going to look at the words in the screens and just use it to meditate and focus upon who God is. How lovely is thy dwelling place? It reminds us that it is a delight to be able to meet in God's house, to worship him together. Just remain seated and focus upon the words. Sing them almost into yourself as we reflect upon the delight it is to be here today.
you, Evelyn. Let's just come to God in prayer once again. Let's pray together. Father God, we do thank you for the loveliness of this dwelling place. We thank you indeed that your word reminds us where two or three are gathered, there you are, and there you are in the midst to bless. And Lord, we ask you at the beginning, in a sense, of another new church here in England, where I for your blessing we pour out upon us. We thank you, Lord, for those whom you've called into covenant relationship with yourself through Jesus. We thank you for the many you've saved. And Father, we pray you would continue to build us up. You would continue us to grow us in godliness. You would help us to continue to carry out that great commission that you left to your church to go and make disciples of all nations, even unto the end of the earth. And Father God, we realize that over this past few months it has been difficult to do this. There's been many obstacles with regards to church life, but we thank you that the witness of the gospel has still went forth. And we pray, Lord, as we prepare for a full return to worship next Sunday, that, that day by day, week by week, that you would begin to open up opportunities, that the restrictions would be reduced, and other activities, other weekly forms of ministry may commence in your time, but we leave that in your hand, because we know that your timing is perfect. We thank you, Lord, that we have been able to continue the mission here in Glenwary in a different way, online. And Lord, we pray today for missionaries overseas. We know that many of them have been restricted in what they have been able to do. But once again, we pray for that unreached people group of Narbasha in India. Lord, on our TV screens this week, we saw how, how COVID-19 has affected India in a, in a serious way. And we pray, Lord, in your sovereignty, the gospel would go forth there in whatever way you would choose and you would save souls and you would build up people in that land. We do pray, Lord, especially for medical progress to continue to be made against this coronavirus. We thank you for the improvements, for the increase in scientific knowledge over this past few months. But we do pray especially for a vaccine. We pray indeed that you would grant wisdom and that a vaccine would be found so its safety would return to all people. We do pray especially for our young people here, those at home, those listening online, those who have returned to school or those who will return to school, those who will be going to university for the first time or those who will be commencing university for the first time. Father, we ask for your hand of protection upon them. Help them to be wise in these days of time. Bless them and continue to grow them in goodness and in godliness. And we do pray, Lord, for those perhaps who are at home shielding those who feel now is not the right time to come back to worship, we pray, Lord, that you would bless them as they continue to follow the services online. And, Lord, that you would sanctify them through your truth. We pray for elderly members, especially within our congregation, those who are in nursing homes, those who, who perhaps we haven't been able to visit over this past few months in the way we would normally want to. Lord, may they know that they are still in our thoughts and in our prayers. Bless especially those who have been bereaved in recent days. May they know your hand. May, know, may they know your peace and your mercy and your strength in these days of time. We well, ask these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading today is from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Uh, we're going to look mainly at the prologue from verse 9 to the end, but I thought it would be good to set it again in context by reading the whole chapter. There's no Bibles, pew Bibles uh, for you. Hopefully over the next week or two, you will get into the habit of bringing your own Bible. It's, you know, whatever, especially whenever I'm preaching, it's much easier if you have a Bible in front of you to follow along and keep you, in a sense, alert to what I'm saying. So Hebrews chapter 12, I'm not sure what page it is because we're not using the pew Bible. Verse 1 to the end. Let us hear God's word. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed. And the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond trees blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fields. Because man is going to his eternal home, 
and the mourners go about the streets before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to, to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and kneels firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd, my son. Beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Let's just seek God's face, seek the illumination of the Spirit upon the preaching of the word. Father, we thank you for the public reading of your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word brings light, and we pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit you will now illuminate the pages of Holy Scripture, both to preacher and to congregation, both here in our building and those listening online as well. Lord, bless your word to our heart's understanding. Help us not only to be hearers of that word, but give us the faith to embrace it and to obey it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's life all about? What's the purpose of living? Does it really matter how I live my life? These are just some of the questions that the book of Ecclesiastes has sought to explore. If you've been following this whole series, you will know that throughout this book, Solomon is the author. He is referred to frequently in the book as the preacher. And the preacher has been assessing a form of thinking which is known as under the sun thinking. Under the sun means to, to live life or to perceive life as if God did not exist. And such a school of thought purports that if there is no God, then there will be no final judgment. This form of thinking would suggest that life is vanity. Life is meaningless. Therefore, it does not really matter how we live our lives. We start this morning at verse 8 of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Essentially, verse 8 serves as a bridge between the previous passage and what we call the prologue, the last few verses of the book of Ecclesiastes. Look at verse 8. There we read these words, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And interestingly, they are the very same words with which the preacher, Solomon, commenced the book. Way back in chapter 1 and verse 2, the preacher said the same thing. He said, Vanity of vanity, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. As we come to the conclusion of this series in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's helpful to remind ourselves of what that word vanity means. I know for, for, for some in my own family, whenever they heard it at the start, they thought, what is this all about? Well, the Hebrew word which we translate as vanity in our dictionary, in our Bibles, is a word used to express the futility of life lived without God. The futility of life lived without God in a fallen world. The, the Hebrew word hevel literally refers to a breath or a vapor. It's like steam that rises from a boiling kettle. It is here today and within an instant it's gone. And so in a sense this word vanity is comparing life to a vapor. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. Life is vanity. Life is futile. Life is meaningless if we do not understand and live life from God's 
perspective. The preacher Solomon has already explained that in numerous chapters beforehand. We have heard how that work is vanity, that wisdom is vanity, that power and possessions, that position, that material wealth, all these things are vanity. They're fleeting. They're here today and gone tomorrow. tomorrow. They're, they're vanity unless we regard them as good blessings given to us from the hand of a good God for our enjoyment. And so as we come to the conclusion of this Old Testament wisdom book, the preacher wants us to understand that life is not vanity. Life is certainly not meaningless. It really does matter, friends, how we live this life. And this prologue in verse 9 through to verse 14 teaches us what our chief end in life should be. You see, the fact is that one day God will bring all things into judgment. And in the light of us, God here instructs us through, his, through Solomon that the whole duty of mankind is to fear God and to keep his commandments. That is what life is all about. That is your purpose. That is my purpose in life. The Westminster Catechism instructs us, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Isn't that right? In a sense, the preacher is concluding the same thing. He's telling us, listen guys, it really matters how you live your life. God has created you to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. And the way you do that best is by fearing him and by showing that you fear God by your humble obedience to his way and to his will. The title of this sermon today, we're not using the PowerPoint because of, of a move over to, to new technology. Well, it'll be back and up and running next week. Is man's chief end. Man's chief end. And if you're taking notes, there are three points I want you to note from this prologue. Firstly, we're going to consider the, the, the how the preacher presents his truth. Secondly, the purpose of this truth. And thirdly, the punchline to it which indeed is the punchline to the whole of the Bible. First, let's consider the, the, the presentation of truth. Now, as a former school teacher, and there's one or two in our congregation here today who used to teach, and some who still do teach in various settings, whether it be Sunday school, whether it be GB or whatever, you will all be acutely aware that in order to deliver a good lesson, you must effectively plan and prepare before you go into the classroom. It's crucial. If we're going to get the message across, the material presented to, to the young people under our charge, we must prepare and present it well. And what we see in verses 9 and verse 10 of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is that the preacher Solomon has certainly been a diligent teacher. He has planned well, he has prepared well, and he has presented the truth in this book very well. The presentation of truth. Verse 9 reminds us that he is wise, but not only is he wise, he has been extremely diligent in his study as he's been inspired by God the Holy Spirit to pen these words. God has blessed him with, with immeasurable wisdom. And the preacher here has used this wisdom to instruct others about man's chief end as God has inspired him so to do. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 tells us that, that Solomon has busied himself weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. He has took time. He has invested energy to weigh up and consider many existing proverbs of his day. He studied all the Proverbs in, in Hebrew literature at the time and, and decided which ones were wise, which ones were true. He has arranged them in a careful manner in which we now find them in the Bible. In fact, 1 Kings 4 and 32 informs us that Solomon presents us with, with some 3,000 Proverbs for our own benefit. So this wise man of God, yes, he may have many faults and many feelings, but towards the end of his life, it seems as if he's displaying a true fear of God. And now that he is gripped by a fear of God, he wants to instruct others to share his fear of fearing God and keeping his commandments. 
Can I ask you in church this morning and those listening online, do you truly fear God? And do you keep his commandments? Is that your chief end? And if you do, if you're given an opportunity to present truth, do you present it clearly like Solomon does? Sunday school teacher, Bible class teacher, preaching to myself as well, do you take time to prepare so that you're able to present that truth well to others in a very clear manner that leaves them in no question what you're trying to teach them? The truth is, we don't possess the genius of Solomon. Sure, we don't. None of us do. Solomon presents this truth in such a clear way. But note also he is a man who's, who displays great literary artistry. Verse 10 says there, the preacher sought to find words of delight. He's a great literary artist. Those who are interested in English literature, for instance, read through this book and you will find some of the words in it are truly delightful. Where else do we find expressions such as, to everything there's a season? Where else do we find expressions such as, the sun rises and the sun goes down? Or cast your bread upon the waters? Or think back to last Sunday, whenever we looked at that majestic poem, which describes old age in chapter 12, verse 3 through to verse 5. It's a, this book is a literary masterpiece. It's a majestic book. And it reflects the majesty of a majestic God who has inspired Solomon to write it. But perhaps more importantly in all of these things with regards to the presentation of truth is his goal. Why does Solomon write these words? Well, look at the end of verse 10. It's to write truth. Uprightly, he wrote words of truth. Solomon is conveying to us here the word of God in all its fullness. He doesn't leave anything out. His message, his truth is serious and it's sober. Yes, he wants to instruct us about the truth of God, about the need to fear God and to enjoy him forever. But he also wants to instruct us about what is life like in a fallen world. Whenever he writes here, he writes about the agonies of old age and he doesn't hold anything back. He writes about the anguish of losing a fortune in this book and he doesn't hold anything back. He presents this truth in a careful, logical, artistic manner. But above all, I believe he's brutally truthful and honest. And what can we learn from that, any of us who seek to present truth to others? Well, we must be brutally honest. If we're called to preach the gospel, if we're called to, called to teach the word of any capacity, we're called to, to share the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Not to leave bits out, not to dilute the word of God, but to teach it in all its fullness. Oh, may we be careful to do that in whatever opportunities God grants us to, to present the truth in all of its fullness. The second thing I want you to note from the prologue here is the purpose of truth. The purpose of truth. Why did Solomon write this book? Well, look at verse 11 and verse 12 and we'll find the answer. In verse 11, we read that the words of the wise are like goads and like nails fixed firmly are the collected sayings. And then he concludes, and they, they are given by one shepherd. The two words goads and nails reveal that there's a twofold purpose in composing this truth. Farmers would know better than me what a goad is. A goad is a sharp pointed stick that farmers use to drive their animals in the direction that they want them to go. If you're using a goad as a farmer, you don't want to, to harm the animal too much. You just want to inflict enough pain to get them to do what you want them to do. Isn't that right? And in a sense, the purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes is the same. The words serve as goads. They, they, they prick our conscience. God, in a sense, is using them to make us uncomfortable to continue to live in sin. And the, the words of, of, of this book, and in fact the whole of the Bible, serve as a stimulus to us. One writer writes the following, Jim Winter. He says, the purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes is not to drive us to despair, but to goad or to shepherd us into the presence of God. The purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes is not to drive us to despair, 
Perhaps it does sometimes when you're trying to work out what it means. But to goad or to shepherd us into the presence of God. So we might think of Ecclesiastes as God's cattle prog, which I'm sure many men here are familiar with. This book of Ecclesiastes, in fact, the whole of the Bible, shows us that to live life to the max is not to be found in fame or in fortune, power or position. It instructs us to remember our creator now, and it insists that our chief end is to fear God and keep his commandments. Is that your chief end? Are you allowing the word of God to goad you, to shepherd you, along the way God wants you to live your life? The second phrase there in verse 11, like nails, remind us of another purpose. The other purpose of this book, and indeed the whole of the Bible, is essentially to to nail or to screw the truth of God's word into our minds. It's to nail or to screw the truth of God's word into our minds so that we won't forget it. Didn't the psalmist write the same thing in Psalm 119, verse 11? I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, this book is like a goad to us or like a nail to us, directing us in the path that God wants us to live. Because you see, this whole book, the whole of the Bible, not just the book of Ecclesiastes, is not just written by a man. Look at verse 10 there. It says that these words have been given to us by one shepherd. One shepherd. Who do you think that's referring to? The Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He is the one who continually guides his people through his inspired word. This verse here reminds us the whole of Ecclesiastes, the whole of the Bible is inspired by a holy God, the good shepherd who laid down his life on the cross of Calvary to save lost sheep like you and me. To bring us back into his sheep pen. And then whenever he has got us back into a sheep pen, he directs us, he he, he prods us, he goads us through his word. Of course, the word of God tells us in 2 Peter 1 and 21 that, that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You see, dear friends, this book, Ecclesiastes, Yes, it's difficult at times, I admit that. Yes, it, it, it does cause a lot, of, a lot of work in the study for the preacher to get the message in his own mind sorted out first before he can deliver it to others. But this is part of the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. It is to be used as a shepherd of our soul to, to, to continue to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And of course, this morning we're being instructed We're being reminded as good Presbyterians what man's chief end should be. To fear God. To keep his commandments. Before we look at that punchline, which we'll come to finally look at verse 12, there we see a word of caution, a word to the wise. The preacher warns us, beware of anything beyond these. Beware, he says, of making many books. There is no end, he says, and much study is is wearisome weariness of the flesh. Solomon isn't necessarily forbidding study here. It's good to read other good uh, books on theology. It's good to to read other good commentaries, which helps us grow in our understanding of God's word. But what he is warning against there in verse 12 is making other books, the study of academia perhaps, to be more important than the study of the word of God. There are many bright intellectuals out there We have no time for God. And sometimes, and I've met people who immerse themselves in all sorts of skeptical thinking, philosophical and scientific thought, and they spend so much time reading and studying them. What does it do? It ruins their relationship with God. It deflects them from their chief end. God's word here today is calling us to to heed the words of the shepherds first of all. Heed the the words of the shepherd, rather, first of all, above any other writings. Of mankind. You see, the follower of Jesus Christ is to make this book our primary textbook. When I say that to you young people at university or at school, you'll be asked to read many other books, but this is the book which should remain your primary textbook. 
Can I ask you, Christian friends, how often do you read it? Again, we're back to basics at the very beginning of a new year in our church life. How often do you meditate upon the Bible, the Word of God? How often do you chew over the, the green pastures that God has given you to graze in? Solomon again is telling us that the purpose of truth, the purpose of God's word is to goad us, to direct us. As we store it up in our hearts, we then will be encouraged to fear God and to keep his commandments. So with the presentation of truth, with the purpose of truth, thirdly and finally, the points line of truth. The points line. What's life all about? Does it really matter how I live? Of course it does. In verse 13, we're given a, a twofold maxim for how we can truly live life to the max, both now and in heaven. We're urged here, having studied so much, the preacher says at the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God, he says. And keep his commandments. This is man's chief end. Fear God and keep his commandments. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the end, nothing else really matters. Our chief end is to fear God. And we will show to others we fear God whenever we submit obediently to his will and to his way in our life. Throughout this book, we've heard Solomon call people to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? Well, you probably have heard online, I've said it a number of times, but to fear God doesn't necessarily mean to be terrified of God. Although that's maybe part of it. Maybe we should tremble whenever we realize his holiness. But to fear God in the biblical sense of the word means to stand in awe of a holy God and just to, to acknowledge who he is. God, friends, is the great almighty God. You and I, we are mere sinful creatures. God is eternal you and I, we are mere vapor. God is sovereign in control. We're dependent on him even to be able to come here today. God is holy. We are unholy. To fear God is to realize who he really is. And in the light of that, to reverently submit to him as Lord of our lives. Do you fear God? Have you really understood who God is? Have you got a glimpse of the holiness, the awe and the majesty and the might and the, and the magnificent of the one true living God? Do you realize that the very breath that you have on your body is on loan from him and that one day you will stand before him on the judgment day and he will judge you for what you've done with your life? Friends, such a realization should cause every single one of us to bow before this holy God, to humble ourselves, to turn from living life our own way, which the Bible calls rebellion or repent or sin rather, and surrender our life to the one true living God. Oh, I pray that if you haven't done that today, perhaps in church, perhaps listening at home online, that you will have sense and will realize what your chief end in life is. It's to fear God. And you see here, the preacher goes on to say how we know if someone truly fears God. We have people who can say they're Christians. We have people can, who can say that they fear God. But the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? Or the proof of the pudding is in the eating, rather. What we see here is that the one, if someone says they fear God, then they will delight to keep his commandments. A true fear of God will be followed by obedience. Did not Jesus say those famous words the night before he died for you and for me in John 14? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Moses expressed the same truth in her call to worship. Today from Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 and 13. He says the Lord requires of you. What does the Lord require of you? Fear the Lord, your God. Walk in his ways, love him, serve him with all your heart and with all your soul and keep his commandments. You see, the punchline here in this whole book of Ecclesiastes, the punchline I would actually suggest in the whole book of the Bible is that we should fear God and keep his commandments. That is man's chief end. Why should we do this? Well, we'll look at, at verse 13 where first of all we're told there that it is the whole duty of man. 
This is the whole duty of man. In Hebrew, that literally actually translates, this is the whole of man. This is the whole of man. What does that mean? In other words, what Sam, uh, Solomon is saying here is that this is what life is all about. This is the purpose for which you've been created. You've been created to fear God. This is the whole of man. One old uh, 19th century commentator, Charles Bridges, has written the following in this verse. He says, to fear God and to obey his commandments is man's whole happiness and business. The total sum of all that concerns him, all that God requires of him, all that the Savior enjoins, all that the Holy Spirit teaches and works in him. So do you want to live life to the max? If you want to live the life to the max, then your, your chief aim should be to glorify God, to enjoy him to ever, to fear God in the words of Solomon and to keep his commandments. Note how the text concludes with a sober warning about those who neglect to seek to live in this way. Verse 14 reminds us of that final day of judgment. That one day every single human being who's ever lived will stand before God in judgment. And on that day God will expose every secret sin and he will uncover even all the, the, the kind deeds that we've done. And you might think you can hide from God now. But by golly, you'll not hide from God whenever you stand before him in the day of judgment. Because the word of God says that God will bring every deed into judgment. Look at verse 14. God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Oh, in a sense, many of us go through lives living, or living as if we're wearing a face mask all the time, don't we? We put on that outward show that, that we're Christians, that we're following after Jesus. Perhaps our mums and our dads and our granddads and our granddads and in their presence we, we live a good life. But as soon as they're, we're out of their presence we, oh, we do anything but what the word of God tells us to do. Friends, the word of God tells us here. Earlier last week I preached about the importance of living life to the max, rejoicing in the goodness of life now and joy life. But in chapter 11 verse 9 we're warned that all these things one day God will bring you into judgment for them. So what is it all about? Well, if there's no God, life is vanity. But there is a God. There is a great God who has created the heavens and the earth. There's a great God who rules over all things. There's a sovereign God. And because of that, one day there is a life to come after this life. One day every dead person will be raised and every person will stand before this God of judgment. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that we all will receive what is due for what we've done in the body, whether that be good or evil. It matters what you're doing now because none of us knows when we will have to stand before God. It matters how we live our life now. Can I ask you, dear friends, if you were to stand before God right now, this very hour, in judgment, how would you fare? Are you ready? Would the Lord be pleased with you? Would he say, come into my kingdom? Have you been using all your time and your talents and your treasures for, for his glory? Has your chief end in life been to fear God, to obey his commandments? You see, it really does matter. It really does matter how we live, what we did, how we did it, even the motive, why we did it, matters. But what matters most of all is this. What have you done with Jesus Christ? You see, this book ends with a warning of judgment. It warns us that one day every single one of us will stand before God in judgment. But it also points us forward, I think, to a day of, of grace, of gospel grace. Because a number of years later, in the providence of God and his perfect timing, God sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross. Why? To take the punishment that you and you and I deserve for our sins. He took the judgment for sin upon himself. And he died. And he rose again on the third day. And the scriptures teach that one day he will return. Acts 17 and 31 says God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. 
by a man whom he's appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You see, Christ died, he rose again, and one day he's coming back to judge every single human being. Are you ready for that day? I pray you are. I genuinely and earnestly pray everyone in this meeting house, everyone listening online, has made proper pray, preparation for that day. The Lord Jesus Christ said in John 5 and 22, that the Father judges no one, but he's given all judgment to the Son. Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but instead he's passed from death to life. Have you passed from death to life? Are those words, wonderful words of assurance for you? I trust they are. And if they're not, I pray that God today will, will stir with up you, up within your soul a holy fear of him. That you'll realize who he is. He's not to be trifled with. That one day he will take the breath away from your body and you will have to stand before him. And so I, so I genuinely pray today that you indeed will seek him if you've never sought him before. That you'll tell him you're sorry for your sinful rebellion. That you will seek to glorify him. That you will bow before him in a holy fear. And then you will receive his son Jesus and go forth and live in obedience to his commandments. Man's chief end. That's what life's all about. Man's chief end is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Let's pray together. Father, we once again thank you for this word that we have found towards the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. And Lord, we do acknowledge that this book is not the easiest of book. It's not perhaps the first book that you would encourage a young Christian to read. But we thank you for the depth of truth, the, the, the great wisdom found therein. And Father, we pray as we come to a conclusion of this series that you would grant wisdom to all who have been following it online or, or those who are in church today. Father, that we would understand what life is all about. That we would understand that you have created us for relationship with yourself. But because of sin, we can't have that. But that relationship can be restored whenever we turn from sin in humility. Whenever we fear you, receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. Father, we pray even today, you might call such people to yourself. That they might receive you by faith. And Father, then that you would give us the strength through your spirit to live for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, Be Thou My Vision. Again, we're not using hymn books. As you know, the, the hymn is on the screen. You, you can stand. I'm sure you're glad. Uh, you're, you're tired sitting. We'll ask you to stand and you can sing as heartily as you want. And then I will conclude just with the benediction. So let's stand as we sing, Be Thou Be My Vision. I wonder, indeed, is this the prayer of your heart? That as we enter into another year in the life of our church, that the Lord would be your vision personally, and that the Lord would grant the vision for us corporately. We know the year ahead may be different, may be different but we know that it's in safe hands whenever we're following his vision. Let's stand to sing.
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. And may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.